Yes. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Uh, Brad, so you can introduce yourself and start and pace uh, as you wish. Sweet. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for having me today. My name is Brad Myro. I'm currently a developer advocate with Google Cloud and maybe some of you are familiar with the role, but just a general, uh, just a general intro to the role is that I mostly focus on enabling Spark workflows on Google Cloud and helping developers succeed. So that nowadays comes in the form of actually doing a lot of talks such as these, where I'm educating folks on Spark and how to do use Apache Spark on Google Cloud, as well as other big data and machine learning technologies. So I've worked a lot with the TensorFlow community, PyTorch, as well as some other big data technologies like Hadoop um, and a little bit of Beam as, as well. Some of these we're gonna go over today if, if you're not familiar with them, but um, yeah, really excited to be here. And uh, Lev and I actually worked together for quite a bit of time and you know we've, we've stayed in close contact. Uh, definitely played a, a very large mentor role in my in my career and still sort of continues to. So definitely appreciate all of his guidance and appreciate being here. So with that, uh, that's enough about me and let's actually just get into the content. So today, very profoundly, we'll be covering Apache Spark and Google Cloud. So what you can expect, nothing too crazy here. We're gonna be discussing, uh, the first part we'll be discussing what Apache Spark is we'll be going over some of the features how you can run it and just a general overview of what it is as a technology and why i love it and why i you know spend 40 hours a week working with the, with the spark community we'll then talk about spark on google cloud i work for google cloud so i'm very familiar with the platform and sort of the approach that we've taken to making spark more accessible to developers that is to say there uh, you know all of the major cloud providers support spark nowadays just given that i work for google cloud you know i'll be talking the most about um, that cloud provider. And then just a couple links and some resources for how you can get started uh, diving into all of the cool stuff that I'm going to cover over the next 30-ish minutes or so. OK, uh, and I'll also leave some time for Q&A at the end I, as well, I believe. Um, but cool, so let's just dive in. Let's talk about Apache Spark. Now, I guess before we get to that, we should talk a bit about the history and why this thing exists. So as computers became more powerful, as there became more data and the age of the internet really started to take off in the early 2000s, there was this idea that, uh, you know, the ability to process data just on a single machine just wasn't becoming feasible as more and more data existed. So in 2004, Google released a paper on the MapReduce framework, which was a paradigm for running parallel computations on large scale data across multiple machines. This was followed up by Hadoop in 2006, which is actually the underlying technology that Spark started out running on. And th there's been some of uh, evolution or a lot of evolution there, which we're going to talk about. But for a long time, Hadoop and MapReduce were sort of the de facto technologies for doing data processing at scale across clusters of computers. This was also accompanied by a technology called HDFS, which allowed you to also store all of your data across multiple machines, but access it with a single, uh, through a single interface such that to the user, it looked like all the data was in one place, but it was really distributed. So we fast forward a little bit to 2012, where the technology Yarn, a Hadoop Yarn came into play. Now, Hadoop as a technology, when it was first released, was very powerful, but there were some limitations in terms of the overhead. Uh, Hadoop, when it, it could really only scale so far, and this technology known as Yarn, which stands for yet another resource negotiator, really allowed Hadoop to scale to virtually infinite machines. Um, and Yarn is still used today, and Spark actually runs on top of Hadoop Yarn. We can then fast forward to 2014, where Matei Zaharia, I'm getting his name right, uh, founded Spark and the company Databricks based off of this technology. So Spark uh, came to be based on the fact that uh, it basically an improvement on the Hadoop and MapReduce paradigm, where Spark focuses on in-memory in memory processing. So you essentially load all of your data into memory, you do the processing, and then you write it back. Uh, and then Spark has seen several evolutions since. So the original release was in 2014. 
In 2016 was the release of Spark 2.0, which introduced a new API on Spark that made it, uh, that just made data processing much more efficient. And then 3.0 came out in 2020 with a lot of under the hood improvements. Uh, one of the big different, one of the nice things about Spark 3, I always say, is that um, much of the changes were not at the API level. A lot of it happened underneath the hood. So migrating to it was not as complex as it was to go from one to two. Still some changes, but a lot of it was really in the uh, in the underlying technology that made Spark as great. And even today, we're in 2022, Spark is continuing to grow. Uh, Databricks, the company that, again, originally created Spark, is doing very well. Google Cloud is doubling down on our Spark efforts uh, as of late last year, and we're continuing to do that and keeping my day-to-day -day very busy and also very interesting because we have a lot of cool stuff uh, going on in Google Cloud. So just a brief overview. And I'll also say there's, there's several others. This Spark is not the only solution to this large scale data processing. There's also Apache Beam, which we're gonna talk about. There's Presto, there's Trino, there's Hive. There's a lot of tools in that, that do, I don't wanna say similar things, but all tackle the problem of solving data at scale. Apache Spark candidly is one of, if not the most popular among them. So, and it's the one that I'm most familiar with. So we're gonna just talk about that here. Uh, Today. But there's lots. This is a really, really interesting space. It's certainly only so much I can cover in uh, about 30 minutes. So that being said, we talked about the lead up. Let's talk about what Spark actually is. Now, on the website, uh, which is spark.apache.org, which is the landing page for uh, Spark, it is described as an open source unified analytics engine for large scale data processing. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the big pieces here is that the, the processing happens in memory and distributed. So all of your data essentially is loaded into the memory of the machines that Spark is running on and the processing happens there and then it's written back to disk after. Instead of doing those constants, uh, you know, read and writes to disk, which just take up a tremendous amount of computational uh, time and resources. Spark has an, a, an incredibly rich ecosystem. As you saw, it's been around for about eight years now. And given that it's one of the most popular data processing frameworks in the world, it works with a lot of other super popular data processing frameworks. Uh, we're gonna talk about some more of the tools that are built on top of Spark. But for instance, uh, in the, actually the latest release, um, the Pandas API was incorporated into Spark. This is out of just a couple months ago. But for anyone who maybe uses Keras on top of TensorFlow, if you don't know what that means, that's totally fine. But it's a similar deal here where you can now run Pandas code and use Spark as the backend seamlessly for an easy way to distribute your Pandas code. But that's to say a lot of other popular tools like TensorFlow do work with Spark as well. So super, super rich ecosystem. You can write Spark code in one of four code languages. The most popular is definitely Python and then also Java, Scala, and R. You can use any one of these four. They're very well supported and they contain all of the same features. Uh, one of the nice things about Spark is that Distributed data processing is actually a very difficult challenge because as you're distributing across multiple machines, there's just a lot of considerations that need to be taken into account, including what happens if you have hardware failure or what happens if data isn't necessarily evenly distributed across your different machines or how should the data be loaded in and just and, and the also the, the logical plan for how all this data should be processed. There's just a lot that goes into it that Spark just takes care of for you. Um, and it really just makes the user experience much easier. There's also a lot of knobs that you can tune with it as well, which does give you that customization. But a lot of the really difficult stuff is taken care of uh, underneath the hood and in, like, just within the, the processing engine itself. I'll also note, and so it says here it's, it's a unified analytics engine. Spark in and of itself is that does contain the code for doing the processing, where others such as Apache Beam in and of itself rely on a separate runner, such as Spark. Spark in and of itself does do the processing. It doesn't necessarily need, or it has, I should say, it has the ability to do the processing itself, but there are some other run times you can, uh, you can run it on. So the way that Spark works is that it, you have your, uh, your cluster manager and then your workers. So we'll start on the top left with this driver. The, so the driver is where the user might be interacting with Spark from. So that can be the command line, a Jupyter notebook, uh, running a Python script in your local Python kernel. And this is where you actually have all of your Spark code that gets run. This gets passed to the cluster manager of Spark, which will essentially take the job and the code and determine how it should be distributed across 
uh, the different workers. Each one of these workers has what's called an, uh, an executor. So this is essentially the, the, uh, the brains behind what is happening in that specific node of the cluster where the processing happened. And each one of those executors can have multiple different tasks. So what's really nice about Spark is that it can be a single tenant or multi-tenant. So you can actually supply multiple Spark jobs to a single Spark cluster at the same time. And then it'll figure out where it needs to allocate different um, resources to or within the cluster where there's extra executors available or extra tasks. And then at the same time, Spark can also figure out, given all of the memory and computational resources available, how it should best distribute the jobs um, across everything. Now, Spark data gets, uh, there's, there's two, two slash three ways that Spark, uh, that you can actually interact with your data within Spark. So, or two, uh, two types of objects, I should say. So the first, and this was the original one, is the RDD, or the Resilient Distributed Data Set. So this is a, is a collection of data that uh, has its own set of APIs that allow you to interact with the data. And you can do things such as map and reduce and filtering on an RDD. Uh, it doesn't contain a schema and it has to do a lot of the inference on its own. And it relies on the serialization of Java and Scala underneath the hood, which are good, but there are some computational limits there. And these were improved upon in the data frame API. The data frame API contains, and, and this also came in Spark 2.0, the data frame API contains um, uh, typed columns, which give you the ability to, which re removes a lot of the serialization overhead and allows you to actually interact with your data using SQL-like language. So you can use what's called Spark SQL, which is literally a dialect of SQL that you could run on top of your data frame. But then you also have similar functionality as you might find in Pandas that you can run on top of the Spark data frame. There's also a Spark data set. Now this exists specifically in Java and Scala. I'm actually less familiar with this and sort of the pros and cons that come with the data frame because I mostly use Python when I interact with Spark. And there's no difference between a, a data set. The concept of a data set doesn't exist in, um, in Python. So really, you know, data frame tends to be the more popular way that folks interact with Spark. Here's some very, very simple Spark code that I actually pulled this off of the website. I'm not sure if it's still there. This was taken at one point. But the idea here is this is just some simple Spark code. Uh, you interact with Spark via the what's called a Spark session. And in this case, we're just reading some data from a CSV file and then doing a filtering. And you can see here that the, the language is fairly SQL-like. You're using a where, you're using a select, and then you can call that show. Uh, what's nice about Spark as well is that it, it executes in a lazy manner. So up until the point that I do the dot show, nothing actually happens in terms of computation. What I actually then, at the point where data processing needs to happen, where I may be doing a call, such as wanting to show the output of the data, that's when the computation ends up happening. So you can write lines and lines of Spark code, build out uh, that, what would be called a DAG or direct acyclic graph of the Spark computation before anything actually happens. Now, given that Spark is one of the most popular uh, data processing frameworks in the world, and given that there are so many different data sets and file types nowadays that data is stored, Spark really supports all of the most popular ones. So we saw an example of a CSV file. It also supports JSON, Parquet, and Avro. It supports all of the popular blob stores, including GCS, S3, and Azure. I'm not sure what the Azure example, the Azure equivalent is, but it supports all of these. Um, of course, it supports HDFS, given that it was originally built on top of Hadoop. It also supports some of the newer file types, such as Iceberg, Delta Lake, and Hoodie. And then it can, of course, integrate with all of the popular data warehouses, including BigQuery, Snowflake, uh, Redshift, and the like. So as I keep mentioning, Apache Spark has a super rich ecosystem. It has all sorts of connectors and functionality to work with those the data sources that I mentioned. But then it also has other uh, components built into it. So Spark, so in terms of the Spark library, so you have Core Spark which provides that functionality that lets you interact with your data. But then you also have these four other libraries that are, again, built into the core Spark distribution. So we'll go left to right. The first one you have is Spark SQL. This allows you to, again, interact with your data in a SQL-like manner. And it's actually how the data frames get uh, processed underneath the hood. 
where if you're using the Python API and you're constructing a data frame and then you end up doing transformations, even using Python code, underneath the hood, the computation happens in the same way. And it uses this uh, highly optimized, uh, what's called the catalyst optimizer, which provides for really efficient processing of your code using uh, Spark SQL. So that's number one. Number two is Spark streaming, which does exactly what it says. It supports the ability to do processing on streaming data. So you can connect this to something like a Kafka stream or PubSub and then uh, do data processing as new data comes in, in either a micro batch or a streaming like manner. There's also MLlib, which is Spark's machine learning library. Now, for anyone who's used scikit-learn, it's, it's similar in nature where you have a lot of uh, essentially black box models that you can configure to run on top of Spark itself. There's also some support for natural language processing. And there's also a really popular library that's not part of the uh, core Spark ecosystem, uh, the core Spark library called Spark NLP that provides a rich set of uh, tools for natural language processing with Spark that works really well with MLlib as well. Um, I think Lev might have even been the one to tell me about that originally. It's a really cool tool. Um, and then last but not least, there's GraphX. And GraphX is the ability to do graph processing on top of Spark as well. So that's for some of the ecosystem. Uh, next, we'll talk about the runtimes, which is at the bottom of the slide. So you'll notice there's four, and I have this deprecated arrow here. So the four runtimes that Spark has historically been able to run on are its own standalone runtime, Yarn, which again is what powers Hadoop, Kubernetes, and then Mesos. I actually learned last night as I was reading for this, that, uh, that I was preparing for this, the last release of Spark actually made Mesos deprecated. So going forward, the only ways that you can run Spark will be with standalone Yarn and Kubernetes. And given that Kubernetes is becoming more and more popular, I'm definitely seeing a lot more uh, Spark and Kubernetes workflows, which is pretty cool to see as uh, companies are standardizing across Kubernetes for, uh, for everything. Now, another awesome thing about Spark is that you have a, a super rich API, uh, UI for diagnosing how the Spark jobs actually ended up running. So I sort of hinted at this before, but when you create a, a Spark workflow, the engine underneath the hood will take the, the logic that you provided and figure out how to most efficiently create the graph of operations so that your job can again happen as efficiently as possible. Uh, tradition, or in, when Spark first came out, this was all configured at execution time. So basically once that you call something like a collect or a show, it'll take the operations and then figure out what the flow should be and then just run it A to Z. Um, in Spark 3.0, there was actually something added called adaptive query execution, which in the middle of the Spark operation, Spark can actually adjust the query to make it more efficient if it's maybe noticing something like data skew or some of the workers may not maybe have failed. So it, it's able to adapt a bit better to lead to more efficient runtimes. But what's really nice about the CUI is that you're able to see the execution both as it's happening, also after the fact, so you can diagnose and figure out maybe your Spark job took a lot longer than you had hoped, and you might and you can see which piece of the um, which piece of the workflow maybe took the most amount of time, so that you can go back to your code and figure out you know what the heck happened. So really, really nice feature. Some other features, uh, there's honestly even more than this, but these were some other ones that I felt were important to highlight and also Lev did as well. So Spark now supports GPUs natively as a uh, as hardware that you can distribute, you can uh, offload workflows to. Now this happens with this happened with significant support with Nvidia, who you know as many of you I'm sure know is the largest GPU manufacturer in the world, and they have open source connectors that allow you to actually do your traditional data processing jobs on top of um, NVIDIA GPUs and offload some of the SQL code. And I believe that's the, the connector is called the Rapid SQL Accelerator. Um, and again, lets you offload some of that Spark SQL workflows to your GPUs, uh, your, your GPU hardware. I touched on this earlier, but Spark clusters can be a single or multi-tenant. So, and there's definitely pros and cons to having both approaches. Uh, sometimes you just want your own cluster and you don't want to worry about other people maybe messing with the, the software environment or maybe hogging all of your resources. So uh, for instance, Google Cloud gives you the option to create those isolated clusters or clusters that are multi-tenant so that you know your whole team can access these. Um, last but not least, 
Uh, Spark supports transactional rights to prevent data loss during uh, processing. So, you know, Spark has tons of features such as uh, checkpointing and then also in terms of being able to use it with other uh, file systems such as Iceberg or Delta Lake. Uh, it provides those acid transactions as it's working on processing the data. Okay, so a question I get asked all the time, maybe someone was going to ask it here if I didn't get ahead of you here, uh, is what is the difference between Spark and Beam? So Apache Beam is another data processing tool that is actually it started and is maintained by Google. It is open source and it is a part of the you know Apache Software Foundation, but uh, you know, it is Google's child uh, where Spark comes from uh, Databricks. And what Beam does is, so Spark has a lot of knobs that you can tune with it. And essentially what Beam is, it's an abstraction layer on top of Spark that makes it easier to do, or makes some of, some of the code uh, a little bit easier to write. Uh, and Beam focuses on this concept of Beam, uh, P collections or uh, pipelines for doing your data processing. I will say, from my experience, the use cases for both of them tend to be fairly similar. They both support batch processing. They both support stream processing. I know a lot of people who would, you know, have very strong opinions on this and would disagree with me. That's just my take. I think at the end of the day, they do very similar things. If anything, I would say that Spark, uh, Spark is definitely more popular, and it has a lot more support in terms of extensions and different add-ons that you can add to it. So, you know, Spark out of the box is better for doing things like um, machine learning and graph processing and some of the other things that we mentioned earlier, where Beam just is inherently uh, less so. I will say as a general rule of thumb, I actually have a typo on this slide, but uh, Spark, I generally say is better suited for doing batch processing, where Beam is stronger for streaming. I have batch here, that's a typo. Uh, I, I typically say use Spark for batch, use Beam for streaming. However, they both can do the other depending on your familiarity and what you're interested in doing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Beam actually runs on top of Spark. So it ends up using what's called the Spark Runner or uh, another open source tool called Flink, which is also built for, um, for streaming. So you have some flexibility and Beam is also heavily supported on Google Cloud as well. We have a tool called Cloud Dataflow that allows you to, it actually serves as, the, it's a separate runner that serves for uh, executing your Beam workflows, but um, so, you, so you have some flexibility there. Okay, so uh, why why should you care about anything that I just said over the last 20 minutes? Uh, Spark is, you know, it, it really, I, I hope some of this has sort of become apparent at this point. If not, I haven't done my job well, but the ability to scale data processing off of local machines to a large cluster is profoundly super important uh, important as the amount of data in the world continues to grow um, exponentially. So if you're just getting started with data science, data engineering, data processing, you know, you're probably using your laptop or your uh, your desktop, but it's just, it's, you know, it could be the nicest desktop in the world. It's still going to be fairly limited in its computational power. And Spark just lets you have essentially, you know, infinite computational resources for doing your job, especially if you shift to something like a cloud provider where you have access to literally unlimited resources and you don't have to go and build out the, the, the physical hardware clusters yourself, which can be a pain in the butt. So you have the ability to scale. You also have the ability to uh, parallelize the data processing. So in particular, if you're doing something uh, involving SQL or you know some sort of MapReduce style uh, computation, there's a lot of parallelization that happens there. So if you're doing it serially using a, a Python, using some older Python libraries or just on your laptop, uh, you just are, it's going to take more time than it could if you were to parallelize it across multiple machines. And that's literally what Spark is here to do. It's here to parallelize and make your life uh, a lot easier. Spark is also incredibly well established. This is, I'm not here to pitch some tool that someone came up with six months ago that we're still kicking around. Spark is here to stay. Uh, the company Databricks that created it is doing incredibly well and they keep pushing Spark. So Spark is here to stay. It's super well established. I certainly don't think it's going anywhere. If I'm being honest, a couple of years ago, I was a little less sure if maybe Spark would, if, if the community would outgrow Spark. I am now more confident than ever that that's not happening anytime soon. It's just very popular, very efficient. All of the major cloud providers are investing in it. Databricks is continuing to invest in it. Spark's not going anywhere. Um, and as I keep mentioning, many open source add-ons available for it. So just a lot of cool stuff that you can do with Spark. 
in the data processing and the machine learning spaces. And as I mentioned, cloud providers make this even easier. Uh, we're going to go through in, in just a moment. We're going to go through some examples of how you can use Spark on a cloud provider. Um, and it, it just the, the ability to take your cluster that maybe has, you know, a, a master worker and four work, a master node and four worker nodes with a single button click, you can quadruple that if you want to or greater. Um, obviously, it costs money, but in terms of if you were going to go and buy the physical hardware yourself, it's just so much easier to go to a cloud provider, uh, in my admittedly a little biased opinion. <sighs> okay, so that's Spark in a nutshell. Next, we're going to talk a bit more about the stuff that I do, which is uh, you know support this uh, support this thing called Spark on Google Cloud. And as it turns out, it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, Spark on Google Cloud is Google taking Spark and just making it even more popular than, the, than it already already was on the on the platform. You know what we're trying to do is make Spark super accessible, super available, however a user sees fit. And one of, in my opinion, you know, my favorite thing that's come out of this is this tool called Serverless Spark. So we've talked a bit about different uh, hardware configurations and how you need to build a cluster that has, you know, a set number of machines. And what Serverless Spark lets you do is essentially not need to worry about any of that. Where you build out your Spark code, you submit it to the Serverless Spark uh, service, and the thing just does what it needs to do. You don't have to worry about hardware or anything like that. It's all taken care of. And what I really like about this is I think it's super beginner friendly. Um, since you don't have to worry about the hardware, you can essentially just focus on Spark. And um, yeah, really cool. So this is supported across many different tools on the platform. And we'll briefly go over a couple of those. But you know, each, each one of these tools could have its own designated 30 minute talk or longer. Um, so we're just going to touch them at a high level. But the idea here is that you can use Spark for whatever you want on Google Cloud. It's integrated with a lot of our other services. And then also, you have different options for how you can use Spark on the platform. So you have serverless Spark. You have uh, Spark on GKE, which is Google Kubernetes Engine. And you also can use traditional compute clusters for doing Spark, uh, which allow you to manage your own clusters. And those will typically be running, uh, will typically use Yarn to process your, uh, to process your Spark data. Okay, so we'll just briefly talk about this, uh, this serverless Spark thing that I keep kicking around. Again, I'm super excited about it. My job is to be working with stuff that I'm personally excited about, and you know, there's no shortage of that here. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the frustrations that come with working with Spark are getting those clusters configured. It's very easy to spin up a cluster that's too large, and you end up underutilizing the resources and paying a ton of money for it. Uh, conversely, it's very easy to spin up a cluster that's too small, that is just taking up a ton of time, a job that you know could end up taking two days, could maybe have taken an hour if you had more appropriately sized the cluster. And obviously a lot of trial and error there for anyone who's ever done hyperparameter tuning with machine learning. It's actually very similar in a lot of ways. It's just how many nodes, how large should the node be? Serverless Park takes care of all of that. So that you can just focus on this job. It'll auto scale on its own. You don't have to tune the infrastructure. No clusters to manage, and you're only paying for you know the the stuff that you're for the processing time that you're using. So now, again, each one of these products that are coming up, like BigQuery in particular, could have. I could talk about well, I my I have colleagues that could talk about BigQuery for hours. I'm just going to go into it at a very very high level, even though BigQuery is super cool. So uh, BigQuery is Google Cloud's data warehouse, serverless. Highly scalable multi-cloud data warehouse that's designed for business agility. That is taken right off of our marketing page. But uh, you know, BigQuery is really cool. It has a lot of different functionality, and it's definitely uh, one of the coolest products that we have. And what's great about Spark and the work that we're doing is that you're able to actually process your your data in BigQuery using Spark. And there's sort of like there's sort of two ways you can do that. So the first is you can process the data, you can pull the data out of BigQuery into Spark, and there's an open source connector that's you know properly named the Spark BigQuery connector that we maintain that lets you pull your data out of BigQuery and do the processing. Um, and then uh, you know you can write it back to BigQuery, you can write it back to a you know somewhere else. But uh, then we also have the ability to run Spark jobs from within the BigQuery console. 
So for folks who aren't familiar, BigQuery gives you the ability to do SQL processing within the console or within a uh, within a within the Google Cloud console. So you can run SQL queries and you can now run Spark queries there as well, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, and again, no infrastructure management. BigQuery in itself has been service uh, serverless for a long time now. So the idea is to just provide a similar experience. Next up is Dataplex. This is definitely a newer tool and I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but it's a tool that we call an intelligent data fabric. It allows you, it, it basically gives you a way to centrally manage all of your, uh, your, your cloud storage buckets, your BigQuery data warehouses, and just other data that you have distributed across uh, Google Cloud in particular. Um, and so, you know, again, taken from the website, you can centrally manage, monitor, and govern data across multiple data lakes and warehouses. You have the ability to spin up notebooks and other compute environments for doing your data processing on data in Dataplex. And of course, because it's a Spark talk, you can use Spark uh, with Dataplex as well. And all of this data is governed in such a way that you can add different security layers and the like. But again, not going to go too much into it. Just another uh, awesome tool in our whole you know, GCP toolbox that I wanted to cover. And then last, but certainly not least, there's uh, Spark through Vertex AI. Now, Vertex AI is a suite of tools for data science and machine learning on the platform. Build, deploy, and scale machine learning models faster with pre-trained and custom tooling. Lots of really awesome options there. There's also a managed Jupyter Lab instance called Vertex AI Workbench that's baked into the platform. And I've been doing a bit of work late, uh, recently, working on some demos that show that integration. Uh, lots of built-in security and authentication on here, GCP security and users uh, can access it. And all of this stuff is automatically applied to Spark jobs submitted through Vertex AI. And then there's also a suite of ML ops tools, including again, uh, the notebook executor, Vertex AI pipelines, Qflow pipelines is accessible here. And then also the abilities to uh, monitor your machine learning training and uh, have uh, uh, something like, that allows you to basically have different types of models saved within Vertex AI itself. Again, I don't want to you know, get bogged down in the details of this. There's a lot to talk about here. But the, the, the long story short of this is that Vertex AI is the, you know, the place that you go to, to for doing machine learning on the platform. And Spark is integrated very well there as well. OK, um, so we talked about some of the product integrations. There's a couple others that I missed, such as uh, Cloud Composer, which is hosted Apache Airflow. And that lets you orchestrate Spark jobs. Um, on, you know, on whatever cadence that you may need. Another awesome piece, just you know, didn't have time for it today. Uh, but we'll just briefly talk about the what we call the flexibility of consumption with uh, data proc. So, uh, and I'll also mention too, so all of the stuff that I'm talking about, this is Google Cloud's take. The other cloud providers have their own takes on them on this as well. There's going to naturally be some overlap. Uh, in particular, if I talk about data proc, you know, uh, this is the place that you go to for just doing, for, for managing all the different ways to approach Spark on Google Cloud. But the other cloud providers have their own tools that do very similar things. So just as a little bit of a caveat. Um, that being said, let's talk about Dataproc. So as I mentioned earlier, Dataproc comes in three different flavors. And there's uh, Google Compute Engine, which are essentially just virtual machines in the cloud. They're equivalent to having just separate physical machines um, it's just all in the cloud. So Dataproc allows you to use Spark using the Yarn runtime and that traditional Hadoop framework. Uh, you can create managed clusters. You have fine grained cost and performance control. So if you are someone who knows what you're doing with the hardware infrastructure, you can set how many machines and the sizing uh, however you see fit. That's one. Two is Dataproc serverless. So this supports the standalone runtime. It does not use Yarn, it does not use Kubernetes. Uh, it figures out all of the resource needs just based on the Spark engine alone. This is definitely the most user-friendly and approachable of the three, especially if you are not familiar with uh, Spark cluster infrastructure or Kubernetes. And so yeah, no clusters, no infrastructure tuning. And then last but not least, it's Dataproc on GKE. This feature is using Kubernetes as the runtime for Spark. And you know, there's definitely some infrastructure expertise needed here, but if you're already a Kubernetes shop, this is a great option for you to uh, for you to use Spark as well, so that you can just manage it along with all of your other uh, Kubernetes containers. 
Okay, so we covered a lot here. Um, in the in event that you are interested in any of this, I hope all of you are, and folks watching later on, uh, you know, hope this was interesting. So some places that you can get started. Uh, I provided a few links here and then one extra thing. So the first is the Spark Docs. Spark.apache.org is a great place to just learn more about Spark, the documentation, the functionality, as well as some uh, demos and tutorials there as well. So that's probably a good first place to start if you want to learn about this stuff. There's also uh, cloud.google.com forward slash solutions forward slash Spark. And this is the landing page on the Google Cloud Docs for how we approach Spark and how we enable it for developers on the platform. And then we also have cloud doc, or another link I have here is cloud.google.com forward slash data dash science. This is the landing page for doing data science on Google Cloud. So it of course covers Spark since that's such a crucial part of the data science workflow. But we also talk about some other tools that we have, some of which were mentioned here, like BigQuery and Vertex AI. But then we also talk about Dataflow there and Google Cloud Storage and some of the other tools that we have on the platform for doing data science. So another really interesting place to check out uh, some of the stuff that you can do. And then last but not least, I've also included the name of the uh, one of the original papers for Spark. Uh, this was written by Matei Zaharia the original creator of Spark and current CTO and co-founder of Databricks, which again is driving much of Spark's continuous success and development. And that's it. So if y'all are still here, thank you so much for watching. I included some of my socials here if you want to connect after the fact or have any questions or every now and then I'll share some Spark stuff as well, especially stuff happening on Google Cloud. So feel free to follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn. And uh, yeah. Thank you for having me, Lev. Thanks for the invite. And uh, I guess I'll stick around for some questions. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. It was very good. Thanks. I think a little over time, too, but I hope it was worth it. <laughs> no, 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 no. That, that, that's fine. I have a question. You mentioned uh, BigQuery and Spark, and I'm mm -hmm. a, a little bit confused. So. You, I understand you can get data out of BigQuery and then process it in Spark, but uh, can you do in opposite direction? Like you are in BigQuery and you actually, well, you mentioned that you can do it in console to run queries in Spark, but you first have to actually move data. Can you do it without moving data? Can you use like a Spark, a data cloud as uh, like an engine running behind BigQuery or it doesn't work like that? So you, you wouldn't, um, so essentially the way that it works, and I, I'm still a little unclear on this as well, but my understanding is, you know, BigQuery in and of itself, it, you know, it's totally serverless, but it has to still spin up those workers underneath your data to actually do that processing. And traditionally, if you were to do this using something like Dataproc, then you have to read the data out of BigQuery, and then you have that IO um, latency that comes with that where by doing it in BigQuery, you're not actually, um, I guess it, it, you're still using the BigQuery infrastructure, but you're, happy, you're uh, processing the data in place instead of needing to move it out to a different service. Um, so it's, yeah, I guess it's all sort of happening there. I'm actually not sure if how that works in terms of the, um, like the optimizations that happen with the BigQuery SQL engine. But um, I, yeah, I mean, at, at the bare minimum, you're saving that IO latency that you would have otherwise had, which isn't tremendous, but it's still you know, always going to be the case as you're shifting data around. I have another question. You said uh, standalone Spark is limited, but with, uh, let's say, Kubernetes or Yarn, it becomes uh, unlimited, like in size. Well, what is the largest you have seen? Like how many nodes? Like what we're we talking yeah. about? Yeah. Um, so I want to clarify, if, if I'm, I may have misspoke by saying that, uh, standalone is not limited, it just has its own different logic for um, adding resources. But um, in terms of size, I mean, you can have, you know, I, I've seen clusters that are a thousand nodes big, you know, and like you could even scale further than that. Um, I, what, you know, I, I don't know that I've seen much larger than, you know, on the order of thousands, but um, you certainly could. And it, you know, it depends. I think you're going to start to see more of that as well as just, you know, we we're processing terabytes, you know, we're starting to see processing of petabyte scale data and it'll just keep continuing to grow from there. 
Um, and Spark is well equipped to do that. And of course, future developments will continue to ensure that that is actually the case. Brett, you mentioned that you now can use GPU nodes. Uh, what about TPU, tensor processing units? Yeah, yeah so that's a good question. Uh, there is not really native TPU support. Um, right now, it's just constrained to CPUs, which are the majority of Spark workloads, and then uh, GPUs, which is a newer thing. Oh, okay. Guys, anybody, questions? Hit me. Lev can ask me questions all evening. I, I know he can, but would love to, <laughs> yeah. would love to hear from someone else. <laughs> okay. Uh, nobody? So you're saying that like part of your job is to kind of uh, relate this stuff to certain clients and just describe the technology a little better. Um, who in particular do you usually end up talking to that's, that's interested in finding out more? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. Uh, there, so there's a couple different audiences. Uh, so some of them happen at, so I guess I'll, I can split that up into like the, the folks I talked to into two high level buckets. So the first are at external facing conferences or talks like this, where I'm really just promoting the stuff that I'm excited about and that I'm working on. Um, so, you know, I, I, lately I've actually been speaking a lot of our external facing Google conferences, but in the past I've, you know, I've spoken at uh, Databricks conferences, JupyterCon, uh, Python conferences, just talking about Spark generally. And then also some of the stuff that we're working on at Google Cloud. And the reason that, I do this is honestly it's like it's it's not from a sales perspective i'll say like i don't necessarily really care i'm just talking about this because i enjoy it i think it's cool i wouldn't be able to do my job well if i didn't so that's sort of why i do this because i think it's awesome and uh you know and i'm biased but that's like part of the folks like some of the folks that i talk to the others are specific um folks who are maybe you know engineering teams at other organizations that are maybe interested in using data proc and spark in their orgs so i'll come in and you know give actually a similar style talk and say hey this is what spark is this is why you might want to use it here's you know given sometimes when i meet with customers i'll be given some uh like I'll be, I'll be told ahead of time some of the problems that they're facing so i might just try and cover those in greater detail and make maybe they're looking to use spark for machine learning so then i might go deeper into that or maybe they're looking to just focus on data processing pipelines Maybe I won't even talk about some of the machine learning stuff, but um, you know, so it, it ends up being, I guess, like you know, the, the long story short, like some of them are customers who are interested in this stuff. Others are just general audiences that are, you know, show up to my talk because they're interested in it and they're just, you know, interested in having a good time and letting me, you know, talk to their face for 35, 40 minutes. Thanks. Yeah. Um, were you involved with uh, putting Spark into production before you started this kind of stuff? Yes, that is another great question. Um, so Lev and I actually met, we were, uh, we worked at the Penguin Random House and we were focused on data warehousing. And so that's sort of where I got my start in the data engineering world. And we didn't actually use any Spark there, but uh, after that I moved to, I, I had used a little Spark previously, but after that I had shifted to work with some other organizations. Um, in the New York City area, which is where I'm still currently based. And there I was actually working on implementing Spark pipelines and working on all of the cool things that I now help other folks on. I actually think that that makes my job a lot easier because I have that perspective of the things that I found frustrating um, and that empathy that's really important in this role because I've, I've, I've been there. So I, you know, I had my role as a software engineer and so I'm now, I guess, I don't want to say giving back because that sounds a little, you know, I don't want to like give myself too much credit, but like, because I've been able to be in the field, in the weeds, really dealing with a lot of the same frustrations that others are, it lets me just come at this work from a different angle than if I had never maybe used it before. Nice. Sorry. <laughs> Guys, let's finish. And I want to say thank you again. It was a very good presentation. I'm stopping the recording.